Okay, team, I am setting up here, but I've got some challenges this morning. And I don't have access to my computer. So we're running this slightly differently. Let's we'll see how it works. If you're able to check in with audio, let me know if you hear me right now. Okay, thank you for checking on the chat. That's fine too. So uh, just be a little bit extra patiently when I set this up. I don't think it'll really impact us. And I also think I still have my recording working. But I may have to go through a couple other hoops here before we get started. If you lose audio during this, then you can throw it in the chat window, but I do not see the chat window directly in the current setup. I do have myself focused on my whiteboard and I do have access to the paper here, but I am not 100% confident that I am recording paper right now. So let's see how that works. I may use the whiteboard because I'm not sure about whether or not I am recording paper. Let me see if I can figure out a way to focus on recording paper. Okay, I think I'm recording paper now. Technology is kind of interesting, right? But everything we do, makes us do things double. So, let me get something else going here. And that might take me a few minutes, so hang on. I pointed you to a copy of some certain notes called the Frenet Frame Derived. And that is on my website. And that may be handy to have while you're working over the next week. And the problem here is I don't know what printers I have access to with this device. It doesn't look like I have lots of printers accessible with this device. Okay, then I'll just have to make do. Let me go back to Zoom. Ah, let me get another cup of papers handy. And I just am double checking. I'm running this off my iPad, which is pointed at my whiteboard. My phone joins the meeting and points at the paper. I just wanna make double sure I'm recording the paper and recording. So let's go with that. From here, I'd also like to see if I'm allowed to share some things.
I don't see the sharing happening the way I want it to happen. So I'm just gonna have to go with this. Okay, so this is the way it is today. Uh, we'll make the best we can of it. And if audio cuts out, then just throw something in the chat and I should be able to catch it. Okay. This is our math 261 course. Delta College. I'll have to be extra careful to advance the paper. So again, I should be able to catch audio. Just say something like paper. That'll warn me. But I'll try to monitor that. So now we're going to focus on our first major calculus victory. And that is characterizing curves in space and the so-called Frenet frame. So we can describe motion in space completely independent of an external frame of reference. In other words, we can describe motion in space only relative to the motion itself what the pilot is experiencing, what the computer is piloting, what the baseball is feeling, what the drone is recording. And we don't have to have an external frame of reference to describe that motion. Questions we're looking at this week. If you want to add any to the list, you can do that. You can throw them in the chat and I'll try to catch them. I'll get a little notification pop up on one of these devices. Observe, I believe you have your first exam next week. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. And if you look at the homework list, and you look at the due dates and so forth. I'm just going to scan back to my web page to do that. This is week four. I'm looking at week five. Yeah, next week we're going to spend reviewing and letting you work on exam one. And I'll tell you more about the format of exam one next time. So just be aware that we're finishing chapter three this week, sections three, one, three, two, three, three, and three, four. And that is the content of the first exam. Now you're gonna do a little more work with Mathematica this week because I want you to practice graphing some more things. I gave you some interesting image to work on for your paper tonight and I received some questions and put out a general clue on that. The problem you're working on tonight from 2.7 is kind of a challenging problem. So show me what you can deliver on that problem. I don't want to give you too many hints 
but I did say in your email, group email, that sometimes you have to describe something in two pieces, right? If I have a rectangle from one to three, and from two to three, a rectangular region in a plane, let's call that R, and I can describe R as X travels from one to three, and Y travels from two to three. Y ranges from two to three, X ranges from one to three. But if I cut a corner out of that rectangle, I'm focusing on my paper. I'm trying to make sure I'm advancing it, but I'm looking two different directions. Okay, I don't have things written to scale, but let's go with it. If I put a figure like this up and call this region R, I can't describe that region with just two inequalities. These two inequalities cover the whole region in the first picture, but I can't give you two inequalities that'll cover the whole region in the second picture. So I'd have to describe R in two pieces. I'm not gonna describe this R for you because I think you could do that. But what I'm saying is, so it may be with the problem from 2.7 that you're working on, you might have to describe the object you're working on in spherical coordinates with two different sections or pieces. Oh, uh, it could be more than two sections, but I don't want to prejudice you. I mean, there are several ways you could address it successfully. Okay, but that was one, con one question I got over the weekend and shared with everybody. Uh, you also are getting used to the folder system every week and you're submitting your homeworks. I'll grade your homeworks, and then I will upload the graded homeworks and a grade report to your own individual Google Drive that I've opened for you. And I sent you the link to that Google Drive. And you can go and retrieve papers there throughout the semester. At the end of the semester, I will have to empty and terminate that folder. Uh, I'll give you some days after we return a final exam to you, but I won't keep your papers forever. So you will keep track of your own papers. You can download them from that folder. You can't upload anything to that folder. Okay. So if you lose track of that, Google Drive address, just let me know. Don't share that address with anyone. It's your private folder. So same way you wouldn't necessarily share your papers with anyone, but that's up to you. Those papers are your property. The other thing I wanted to say, and I did post some pointers to this last week. Remember that you're preparing your files for submission as single PDF files. Do not send three PDF files for two problems and then attach three or four images to them, one file at a time. You're working on presentation and presentation means you don't give your supervisor the files of the report to assemble. So you make sure that you assemble the files in a single PDF before you submit it, please. And I've kind of tried to remind people over the first three weeks about that procedure. It's written in our syllabus. I gave you some ways to do that. If you're still unsure, please talk to me. But starting in this week, I won't accept any multiple file submissions. I'll just say that homework wasn't submitted. So if you have an issue, contact me now ahead of time, but just learn to prepare things in a single PDF file. And there's multiple ways you can do that, as I described in the email. Okay, so let's get into our Frenet frame.
Uh, any number of things are disturbed here. So I have to see that I even have a clock to look at so I don't go crazy on time. So let's consider this curve in space. And we will orient the x, y, and z axes with the right hand rule. And I will pick a color for curve. And colors don't show up excellently in the recording, but they do show up when I copy these papers. So let's say, and I don't want this to be too dramatic here. You know, it could be any curve looping through piece. Think of a piece of wire bent into space. Let's just make a curve and one loop and out the door like that. Okay, so let's call this curve C. It will be parameterized by a function R of T over an interval from A to B. And that means that when T is equal to A, you're at position R of A. This could be over here. When T is at position, when T is equal to B, you're at position R of B, which could be over here. This is at time T equals A, this is at time T equals B. The position is called R of A, and this position is called R of B. Now remember, R is a vector, so I'm thinking of R of A and R of B as literally vectors that shoot to that point. But we've already done this a couple times, thought of the name of a point as the endpoint of a vector. In that sense, you can think of the name of a point and the vector that takes you to that point from the origin, basically interchangeably. When you specify a starting time and an ending time, then you naturally specify a direction. I started here and I ended here. That means I went this way on the curve. So this is called an oriented curve. It has an orientation. And we're gonna make another simplifying assumption before we go on right here. And in the old days, this didn't really come into play, particularly when we're talking about an aircraft or a spacecraft. But I would like to measure all kinds of qualities on this curve. And everything is going to be within my reach. How long is it? How fast am I going? What direction am I going? What direction am I turning? What direction am I rolling? How sharp is the curve? What are the components of acceleration at this moment or another? I'm going to have access to all of those things, but I need to make one simplifying assumption on this curve here first. That the curve is smooth. And smooth you used in the context in calculus one and two to mean a curve that didn't have any sharp kinks to it. So previously smooth to you meant no sharp kinks like that or like the absolute value graph. Both of those things right there, make sure I'm moving my paper properly, are not smooth. And so it could be in space. If you think of this as a copper wire, like just household wire that you've bent into a path in space, you could demand that it has no kinks in it. And that doesn't seem like a heavy burden when you're talking about an airplane, because airplanes don't just fly up to a spot and then immediately switch directions and fly on the other direction, right? Aircraft do not turn at a sharp corner. Neither do cars, neither do baseballs, except you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, what happens when the batter strikes the baseball? 
doesn't at that moment the ball experience a very sharp curve? Distance coming in, the ball coming in, the ball going out, there's a sharp point to that ball's path. Yes, that's right. And you might deal with that in the next class, but not right here. But smooth to us means three lines in mathematics. It means equivalent to or the same as, or this means. that the velocity is never zero. Now we're gonna characterize that in a couple of different ways, but you'll see in a few moments why to do the analysis I do, I must demand that the velocity is never zero. And like I said, this doesn't seem like a great burden for talking about an aircraft, but now you're living in the age of drones, right? You know, drones coming up here, stop, drone hovers in midair, drone takes off in a different direction. Am I saying we can't analyze those paths? No, we would have to analyze any path like that the same way you did in calculus. If you had a curve that was not smooth in calculus, I'm gonna still work very carefully with my paper here, so excuse me for being a little slower. What you do is, deal with this curve in sections. You'd learn things about this curve in sections, like what's the highest point, what's the lowest point, and then you'd have to do what? Look at the bad points or look at the troublesome points where things were not smooth, not differentiable, separately. So smooth to you in calculus meant differentiable meant has a derivative. And we'll have to come back to that notion later because we have to improve on it in this class. But right now, let's make an agreement, you and I, that smooth means I am flying through space and the velocity is never zero. I'm driving my car in three dimensions. Well, I always drive my car in three dimensions, right? Even if it's on flat ground, I'm driving in three dimensions. And to say the velocity is never zero means literally I never stop. So we're analyzing paths that don't stop in midair and don't stop motion on the ground. Okay, so let's write down a couple of questions right here. So this first natural question, How long is C? Keep checking my paper. So excuse me if I'm a little bit slower. How long is C? This is an idea of length. Length of a curve, and you've done length of a curve in calculus, but now we're gonna do it in three dimensions. So let's take, and I do this in my notes, let's take a small section of that curve C and excise it right here so we can focus on it. And let's say I'm going to chop curve C into little distance pieces called DS. And I'll do what every good calculus person does. If I want to know the length of C, I will add up all the little pieces that I chopped up, all the little DS sections from T equals A to T equals B. Or I could say, I will chop the curve into little pieces and add up all the little pieces over the curve. Here I'm displaying the curve, here I'm displaying the endpoints A and B. The endpoints A and B depend on T and I'm talking about a variable S right here. So how are we gonna relate that? Well, let's do a super zoom on this little DS right here. Let's take this DS out over here and do a super zoom on it. And I'm still monitoring my paper. Thank you. And let's say that that DS is composed 
have a little bit of distance in the x direction, a little bit of distance in the y direction, and a little bit of distance in the z direction. Right? So this is a little bit of x, a little bit of y, and a little bit of z. Let's say I'm taking this little piece ds so small that it's just about nearly straight. Or I could say that even if ds has a bend to it, the straight distance from this point that I chopped at to this point that I stopped chopping at is very much like the straight line, same length as this path ds. When I say x, y, and z, what am I referring to? Well, remember, back to move the paper up here, that r of t as a description of the path in space tells me its x position, its y position, and its z position at any moment t. And that the derivative of x, y, and z will be the rate of change in the x direction. Watching my paper, the rate of change in the y direction and the rate of change in the z direction. And that will be the rate of change of position with respect to time. This is what we call velocity. So if I think of the dx, dy, and dz, remember by the third dimension Pythagorean theorem, ds squared is equal to dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. That's just Pythagorean theorem three dimensions. Think of these two right triangles that I have sitting right here. And I can relate these two objects. ds is equal to the square root of dx dt, I'm sorry, of dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. But if, if I take the magnitude of this vector v, and I'm clamming too much into this paper at once. I'm cramming too much in this paper at once, so I'll go to another paper. How do I take the magnitude of vector v? I square dx dt. I square dy dt. And I square dz dt. And then I take the square root. So compare these two lines. The only thing that's different between these two lines is each factor in the denominators here inside my magnitude of v expression, each piece has a dt squared. I could factor out that dt squared. Now I'll go to another piece of paper. I'll try to keep this one handy for a second. I'll try not to drop things. So I could say magnitude of V is equal to dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared over dt squared. Each one of those factors has a dt squared. And you say, well, you're not allowed to split up derivative notation like this, but you've already done this in calculus. I can think of dx as a little bit of x. I can think of dt as a little bit of time. When I take this perfect square dt squared out and bring it to the other side, this says mag v dt is equal to square root of dx squared plus the square root of dy squared plus the square root of dz squared. Well, the square root of dx squared plus y squared plus z squared square rooted, the sum square rooted, excuse me. And this is what 
I recognize geometrically as my ds. So mag v dt is ds. The speed, our magnitude of velocity is speed. The magnitude of the velocity, how fast I'm going, 90 miles an hour is magnitude, times a little bit of time, three seconds. If I'm going 90 miles per hour for three seconds, I'll cover a certain number of feet. I'll cover a certain small distance. So that is how I'm going to understand length. Length is chopping the curve C into little pieces and adding up all the little pieces. And to do that chopping, I'll recognize the ds is mag v dt. And I'll integrate the t's from t equals a to t equals b. So that's a complete formula now. Excuse me, I slide it up. I number that page. If you want me to write it out in full glory, then no problem. But usually, this expression integral from a to b mag v dt is the one that we use in everyday life. So mag v dt is dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. Now this is really beautiful here, right? But the problem is with this idea is What if I'm flying a little Piper Cub on this path and you're flying an F-15? Let's pick a path that both of the planes could cover, right? Because a lot of paths that the Piper Cub can execute, the F-15 can't, and vice versa. When I say to you that the length is calculated from the speed, your first natural question is, well, what if a plane is flying different speed? What if I have two different cars driving that path? What if I have two different people running on that trail? Does length depend? on the speed that I'm traveling? Well, the answer is yes and no. Yes, the calculation depends on our description of the path. Get this paper out of my way. Yes, the calculation depends on the parameterization of the path C. But no, the quantity length is independent of parameterization. parameterization, but here comes the big catch. If the velocity of your craft is never zero. Now notice I'm using velocity and speed kind of casually and carelessly, right? Here, when I said smooth, is velocity is not zero. The velocity vector is not the zero vector. But here I'm thinking of smooth as my speed is never zero. And this is a number, and this is the number zero. 
Unfortunately, they're the same thing. If I say my velocity is ever zero, then at that moment, the magnitude of that velocity must also be zero, right? So if velocity is zero, then speed is naturally zero. And then likewise, if the speed of an object is zero, that means it's not covering any distance, then its position is not changing and it will have zero velocity. So notice difference. This is really important. between speed and velocity. And I'm gonna emphasize this by describing it more exactly, speed and velocity. This is the rate of change of position with respect to time. And speed is the rate of change of distance with respect to time. In notation, get used to observing these two derivatives. Velocity is the rate of change of position r with respect to time. And speed, which is the magnitude of velocity, is the rate of change of what with respect to time? Back to this calculation. ds is distance, little piece of distance. dt is a little piece of time. So what must speed be? The little piece of distance divided by the little piece of time. The instantaneous rate of change of distance with respect to time. This is ds dt. And so these two things people casually mix up, but you're not allowed to mix them up. Speed is the rate of change of distance with respect to time. Velocity is the rate of change of position with respect to time. So how do I know that length does not depend on speed? Well, let's think about this. Distance. What's distance in your car? Distance in your car is an odometer reading. The odometer is the device in your car that measures the distance you've covered. 30 miles, 40 miles, 500 miles, three miles. Let's take two cars traveling up a circular ramp in a parking garage. And I try to draw the circular ramp the same in both cases. Let me tear off my paper. But this is the same circular ramp drawn the same. And I'm going to drive up it in my you know, pickup truck. I don't have a pickup truck, but my really slow car. And you're going to drive up this in your Maserati or your Bugatti, whatever your dream car is, right? Well, logically, we know that this is the same distance up the ramp. Or think about, you know, Fast and Furious Tokyo drift when they're drifting in the parking garage, right? I might drive slowly and smoothly up this curve. Ah, there I'm using the word smooth. You might drive fast and smoothly up this curve. But will our odometer readings say exactly the same thing? Yes. So long as what? So long as when you're racing me up this ramp, you don't travel 
stop, double back, and then finish going up the ramp like that. Well, if you traveled to a certain point, stopped, came back, doubled your path, and then came back again to the top, naturally your odometer reading would be greater, right? If odometers ran when the car runs in reverse, no? Frankly, I don't know enough about cars to remember. If that's the case, I don't think odometers run in reverse because then you'd have some kind of, you know, legal issues. But if you could turn around on that ramp in your Bugatti, yes, if you ever stopped, turned around, stopped again, turned around, and then continued to the top, yes, your odometer reading would be different than mine. Yes, the links would be different. But why was that the case? Because even if we traveled up the same ramp, we traveled different paths. You stopped along the way. So what did we say at the beginning? The measurement of length will be solid as long as you and I agree not to stop in midair or mid path and double back and then continue on. So this is a really important observation. The calculation of lengths does depend on the parameterization you're using if you're driving a faster car than me. But the quantity length is independent of parameterization if the parameterization is smooth. And that means that we can have what's called a master parameterization. In that sense, we could have a baseline parameterization, a master parameterization, a test parameterization. I'm trying to think of words that mean what? An agreement, parameterization. An agreement between you and me that we're gonna run our test vehicle in a certain way so that we are measuring things equally. And for a smooth curve, this master parameterization, this baseline parameterization, has a special name. And you already have experienced it. It's called an arc length parameterization. And you've already experienced it. So let me, sorry, I didn't slide my paper up there nicely. Let me explain what I mean by arc length parameterization. So apparently length is the integral from A to B of the magnitude of velocity times the elapsed time. So this is an integral summation. And this is the whole length from t equals a to t equals b. But your odometer is doing something else. Your odometer in your car is telling you the length as you drive along. Your odometer in your car is telling you the elapsed length. Right? So your odometer is telling you the length from your starting place to any intermediate place along the way. 
I don't want to use T here and here to be the same, so I might attach a subscript to this in a second. But let's say your odometer is telling you the distance from T naught to any future T along the way when you press the reset button on your odometer. And when you think of it in that way, your odometer is a distance function. Your odometer shows you distance as a function of time. This is an arc length function. Or in plain English, distance is a function of time. So if we make the agreement that our velocity will always be set equal to one, we're going to drive this path at one mile per hour. We're going to fly the spaceship at one light year per second. Whatever units are relevant here, if we set ds dt equal to one, then what we're doing is measuring out, let me put the SDT equal to one here, let's make this variable switch. Remember, velocity is the SDT times DT. Now I'm measuring, summing up of the little S's and calling that Distance. Distance is the sum of the little distance pieces along the way. Now, if I write it this way, I have an arc length parameterization. It's what allows us to measure distance on a freeway. In fact, you're quite used to that. As you drive along the freeway, you see the mile markers, 1.0, 1.2, 1 1.4, little green vertical signs like this, right? 1.0, 1.2. Now, I don't know exactly how the letters are oriented, but you've seen these signs as you drive along the freeway. 1.6, 1.8. This is an arc length parameterization of the freeway. And whether you're driving your Bugatti or I'm driving my pickup truck, if we start here and end here, we've both covered 0.8 miles. So you can measure a path in space by the time that has elapsed. But as long as the velocity is never equal to zero, you can measure path in space. That is, you've never stopped or you've never stopped and doubled back and then kept going. You can also parameterize a curve by its arc length. And then you can talk about the rate of change of position with respect to distance. Now, just be patient for a second, and I'll tell you why I'm being so careful. The rate of change of position with respect to distance. Now, by the chain rule, remember you've got calculus in your pocket, right? With this paper going on here. By the chain rule, the rate of change of distance with respect to position must be 
the rate of change of distance with respect to time times the rate of change of, let me say that again, excuse me. If I want to understand the RDS, I can think of the RDT equal to the RDS times the SDT. This is multiplication. It's not a dot product. Remember, the chain rule says the RDT is the RDS times the SDT in a simple, in a kind of a too simple way. I'm canceling out the DSs, right? So this, remember, is velocity. And this is speed. So what is the RDS? What is the rate of change of position with respect to distance? The rate of change of position with respect to distance is the velocity divided by the magnitude of the velocity. I don't want to write those words out. Velocity divided by magnitude of velocity, but you know this with a different shorthand. We called it direction. V over mag V is what? Direction of V. So I got my curve here in space. or my airplane that I'm flying through space. And at this moment, I have a certain velocity. But if I take the velocity divided by its magnitude, what do I create? I create the direction of the velocity. This has a technical expression in calculus and curves. This is called the unit tangent vector. It's given the name capital T. The unit tangent vector is what in plain English? The direction I'm going. Okay, we're coming up on a break here, but I want to emphasize before we get to the break. So I'll put my curve parameters in here. T equals A, T equals B that creates an orientation on this curve. And at every moment on this curve, so long as the speed is not zero, I'm allowed to form this vector. So long as the velo velocity is not zero, so long as the speed is not zero, I'm allowed to form this vector. And this vector does a service for me. What service does it do? It tells me the direction I'm going. It's called the unit tangent vector. So this is our first major victory. What direction am I going? How long is the path? Do I have an odometer on this path? The length of the path is this integral. The odometer is this measuring of distance as time elapses. And now I even have a vector that tells me what direction I'm going. You're not terribly impressed if you're in a car because you have a feeling you know what direction you're going. 
what direction am I going? I'm going on the direction of the road, right? But if you were driving in the wilderness with no road, you certainly want to know what direction you're going. And then you'd rely on some exterior tools like GPS, compass, so on and so forth. Okay, so here's our first major victory. So let's anticipate. And then we'll take our break. Well, if I was only going one direction for my whole life, then I guess this would all be I, all I care about, right? Remember the band One Direction? Awesome band, depending on your point of view. But they only had one direction. They kept repeating the same song time after time after time. It got a little bit boring. That's the joke. People said that's why they were called One Direction. Now, don't send me any One Direction hate mail if you happen to be a fan. I'll let you be a fan of anything you like. I have my own favorite bands. But this would be pretty boring if I was always going in the same direction. And I indicated this on this curve here. Oh, I must be turning. I must be banking. So what does that become? That becomes my next question. What direction am I turning? That's how I'll say it in English, but we're going to say it in a different way mathematically. And then, you know, if you're flying an airplane, and I've never flown an airplane, but if you're turning, you're generally doing what? You're generally banking. You're kind of like, even if you're going on a freeway off ramp, you're banking. If you're driving on a racetrack, the racetrack is not flat. The racetrack in the corner is banks. And then we have this problem. Let's look at the bank of a racetrack right here, where gravity tells us that this is down. But as I go through the curve, acceleration tells me that that's down. Or conversely, gravity says up is like that, but I feel that up is like that. So with respect to the point of view of gravity and with respect to the point of view of the path, up has different meanings. So that must be the next question I wanna ask. What direction is up? But I guess I'm going to have to define up more carefully, right? Let me write down a couple more directions, uh, a couple more things, and then we'll take our break. Uh, as I fly through here, I inherently feel that sometimes I'm turning gradually, and sometimes I'm turning sharply. Like at this moment right here, I think I'm in a sharp turn. a sharp curve. And right here, I think I'm in a gradual curve. As you drive along the freeway, the general path is you're going 65 miles an hour is that you're on gradual curves. But as you take that off ramp, you go into a sharp curve. And then what do they do? They warn you to slow down to 25 miles an hour or something like that, right? So there must be a concept called how sharp is the curve? That's how we would say it in English. And we're going to use the mathematical word curvature. Curvature measures the sharpness of a curve, denoted by Greek letter kappa, which looks like a Capital K written small. And then one more. After how sharp is the curve, what happens if you take that off ramp too fast, right? Well, you might feel misdirected out of your seat and you, oh, thank you. 
I apologize that the move that paper up there. If, if that's what I, and I noticed something flashed across my screen. Remember, I don't have access to everything, but I think that's what you were warning me to do. Thank you. If I take that curve on the freeway off ramp too sharp, I'll actually roll out of the curve. Well, a race car driver would feel what? Pushed up against the wall? That is, if they remained in control, they would push up against the wall. They'd feel a force driving them to the wall. But if they lost control, the frequent cause of accidents on freeway off ramp, you're taking that off ramp too fast, then you literally, literally roll out of the curve. So I'd like to know how I measure the roll of a path, the tendency of that path to twist. And the fancy word for that in mathematics is called torsion. And you can see this also in cords and ropes. Okay, so now we're gonna take a break because I went over my time a little bit. It's, I got 9.02. I'm gonna come back at 9.08. And we will answer all of these questions and more. But we have our first weapon in our heads out readout. We have an odometer. Now we have a direction indicator. I think I'm gonna mute my microphone as I take this break, but my equipment's different. So you take a break, you stretch your legs, I'm gonna do the same, and we'll come back in five minutes.
Okay, welcome back. So, I think everything is progressing reasonably. I have the audio on, I have the recording on, I have the paper pinned. So it's kind of funny how much you depend on technology. And you feel lost if you change any tiny little thing. Well, let's go on. Whether you recognize it or not, with this unit tangent vector, we achieved a great victory. So let's see if we can find something else out here. So I'm going to attack these questions one at a time. And if my presentation fails, remember you have notes on my website called the Frenet Frame Derived, where I'm going through all of this too. But here, at least you get to hear me saying words alongside of it. So the next thing I'm going to do is define the direction of turning. And right now, I'm having a theoretical discussion, right? This is not necessarily the order in which I would calculate things. But this unit tangent vector is pretty cheap, pretty inexpensive. Just differentiate position, take the mag of it. You've got the unit tangent vector when you derive, when you, when you divide. So now I want to know what direction am I turning? So I'm going to have to draw a couple pictures, but let's start out with just a very gradual curve right here. And let's say that I'm at this point on the curve. And let's call this vector the unit tangent vector, which we've just defined. Well, before I say what direction I'm turning, I even have to understand what it means to turn. Let's think about this. If the unit tangent vector never changes, then I must not be turning. Now you could say as I drive that drag strip on the salt flats, that my velocity could be greater or lesser at any one point in the time trial. But whether my velocity is greater or lesser, whether my speed is greater or lesser, if I'm traveling in a straight line, doesn't matter how the velocity varies, I will always have the same direction because velocity divided by magnitude velocity is one. So I am not changing direction unless T is changing. That seems like a silly thing to say. They're used to, you put it down in the category of obvious, but it's the starting block. The next question you would ask then, well, if T is changing, then what can change about T? Remember, T is a unit vector. T is one unit long, no matter what direction you're pointing, T is one unit long. T has its own magnitude. that's fixed at one and has its own direction. And since T is length one, T divided by mag T is just T. T is its own direction. So a vector only has two properties, magnitude and direction, right? If the magnitude is not changing, the only thing that can change about T is its direction. Let's go to another piece of paper up here so I can add more to this. How can change, how can T change? T 
can only change its direction. How can we measure that change? Well, if I'm looking at a smooth curve, I actually have two ways to measure that change. I can measure the rate of change of t with respect to time. As I drive down the freeway, fly my plane, my direction changes as time changes. Or I could measure the change in direction of t as my distance changes. So since I do not want to write words all the time, I want you to practice speaking these. The rate of change of the unit tangent vector with respect to time, the rate of change of the unit tangent vector with respect to distance. It would be a little bit lazy and casual for me to call this dt dt or dt vector dt, because that sounds confusing. So in your mind, you pronounce this, the rate of change of t vector, the rate of change of the direction of motion with respect to time, the rate of change of direction of motion with respect to distance. And as it happens, these are the same under what condition? Well, by the chain rule, we know they're related by this measurement. If S is my odometer reading, then what is the SDT? Magnitude of velocity, speed. What is this? This is my speedometer reading. The speedometer is the thing that tells you how fast you're going. If you and I agree to drive on our test track. One mile per hour, one kilometer per second, one light year per day. Whatever one means to us, whatever context we're in, if we agree that the velocity is one, then these two quantities are the same. Sorry, move my paper up here. The dt dt and dt ds, a little bit sloppy, are the same. They're the same vector. So let me define, I will define the rate of change of direction with respect to distance as the direction I am turning. And I'll say this, and it sounds funny that I say this, but let me be very specific. Let me be very exact. This is a vector. The rate of change of a vector with respect to time, remember I vector differentiated each let. This is also a vector. It has magnitude, and direction. I'm back in this drawing right here. And everything is relative. Remember, this curve that I'm presenting on this paper to you is not necessarily a curve on the paper. It could be a wire in space. It could be a road through a mountainous region. But as it happens, I notice that T is changing by kind of curling to the left. 
So you would say, are you going to turn left or are you going to turn right? Here, it looks like I'm turning left. So this is the direction of turning. Let me draw this arrow right here. Let's call this arrow dt ds. Now, you say, well, isn't there a concept of sharp turn, gradual turn? You Can you just say left, right? You can't do that. How do you know the turning arrow wasn't going a little bit less extreme? Well, I'm going to show you that the direction I'm turning is naturally and automatically perpendicular to the direction I'm going. How do I show two vectors are perpendicular? I show that their dot product is zero. I'm going to add this right here. Notice dt ds dotted with t is naturally zero. You say, I don't see that. Let me show you. And again, whether I say dt ds or dt dt doesn't make a difference if we're on our test track. So at any moment when I need it, I'm just going to assume we're on our test track, that velocity is one and I am never stopping and doubling back. How will I show this to you? Well, first of all, you admit that t dot t is one. Why? Because t dot t, any vector dotted with itself, is automatically the magnitude of that vector squared, right? That's one of our identities for dot product. And since magnitude of t is one, that makes t dot t equal to one. So t dot t is constant. Now let's pull out our calculus knowledge. Let's differentiate both sides with respect to distance. Let's differentiate both sides with respect to time. It wouldn't matter which one I choose. Let's just differentiate both sides with respect to this parameter called s. Excuse me, I'm moving my paper up and I'm numbering the paper. Well, the derivative of a constant, no matter what you're measuring against, is always zero. It's the number zero, right? But what about the derivative of dot product? Well, dot product obey the product rule. That's one reason we were allowed to call it a product. And that is the derivative of the first times the second plus first times the derivative of the second. That's the standard product rule from calculus. But also the dot product says what? U dot V is the same as V dot U. So this actually says two T dot DT DS is zero. So this is a useful trick to remember. When you differentiate a constant, you get zero. So if you have a quantity that's constant, when you, different, when you differentiate a quantity that's constant, you always get that quantity equal to zero. And when I differentiate this quantity, I get two t dot t dt ds is zero, but then I, the two is irrelevant. I divide both sides by two. This says t dot dt ds is zero. This says t and dt ds are naturally, or if you prefer this word, automatically perpendicular. Let me go back to my drawing. So when I drew dt ds as perpendicular to t in this drawing, and I could have drawn an angle and then made my little perpendicular marker at an angle, right? But 
DTDS, the direction of turning in is automatically perpendicular to the direction of going. Now, what's the next step you're gonna do? You can already anticipate this. If I'm doing a super duper turn, then this DTDS is gonna be very large. If I'm doing a gradual turn, this DTS is gonna be very small. Large and small in what? Large and small in magnitude. DTDS of a large magnitude means sharp turn. DTDS of a small magnitude means gradual turn. But all I care about is the direction of turn. At that moment, I want to know what direction I'm turning. Remember, T is one unit long. So let me make a one unit long vector and call it the direction I'm turning. This is called the unit normal. The unit normal vector. It's defined in the most simple way possible. I will take the vector dtds and divide by the magnitude of the vector dtds. Because anytime I divide a vector by itself, by its own magnitude, excuse me, anytime I divide a vector by its own magnitude, I get what? A unit vector. This unit vector happens to have the same direction as the direction of turning. So now I've defined a unit tangent vector and a unit normal vector. Now here's where we're gonna be careful now. But let me write down what we have in our hand so far. We have a unit, make sure my paper is good. We have a unit tangent vector. Which is T, which is V over mag V. And I don't want to get too symbol hung up, right? But that's the rate of change of position with respect to time divided by the magnitude of the rate of change of position with respect to time. If I fall in love with these symbols too much, I just end up creating messes, right? So usually people just say V over mag V. Now I have the unit normal vector. And that is called N. And that is the TDS over mag DTDS. And mag DTDS in some sense is the magnitude of the rate of change of direction with respect to distance. As I'm driving along the track, it's hard to do with a camera. If I change my direction, oh, we call direction red. T vector was red up here, right? So I'll stay consistent with that. If I change my direction gradually as I go along the path, then I'm doing what? Changing the direction over a great distance. That's what I call a gradual curve. But if I, over a very tight, short distance, radically change my direction, then what have I done? I made a large magnitude in the rate of change of direction with respect to distance. This is a horrible mouthful. The magnitude of the rate of change of direction with respect to distance. So we give it a short name. We call it curvature. And we denote it with a lowercase Greek letter kappa. I don't know how to tell you to make a kappa, except 
make a K with a curly side and make it smaller than your normal capital K. So it looks like capital K with a curly side, but printed small. You can see how it's represented in books and movies. I gotta see what number page I'm on. Good. So let me talk about this right here. Gradual curve, kappa is small. Tight curve, kappa is large. Notice kappa, because it's a magnitude, is always greater than or equal to zero. In fact, if kappa was zero, there'd be no change of direction and I'll be traveling in a straight line. So small kappa means gradual curve, large kappa means sharp, sharp curve. Now let's use your imagination. At the moment I'm on that sharp curve, it almost looks like I drew this on the paper too, doesn't it? It's as if I was on a circle. Or here, even on this gradual curve, it's at least as if I was on a giant circle. I don't know how giant I'm going to be allowed to draw this circle and stay on camera, right? So small kappa, large radius of curvature. Large kappa, small radius of curvature. R is the radius of curvature. Now I get in a lot of trouble now because I use vector R for position and lowercase r here for radius. So you have to adjust. But there's a very simple relationship between the curvature, kappa, and the radius of curvature, and that they're reciprocals each other. If kappa is one tenth, then the radius is 10. If kappa is 1,000, then the radius of curvature is 0 0.01. 0 0.001, excuse me. So fix that relationship in your mind. OK. What direction am I turning? I've answered it. Now it's time to answer what direction is up. And again, this is kind of colloquially. I mean, up depends on your perspective, right? But let's say from the perspective of the curve, and be careful, the perspective of the curve is not always the perspective of the person sitting in the airplane. I'm talking about from the perspective of the road. Like I said earlier, it's the perspective of the racetrack on which the car sits in the curve. Then with respect to that, with respect to the racetrack, up is perpendicular to that bank. And we can examine the bank of a road or the bank of a racetrack. But the bank of a plane as it flies through space is kind of invisible. We don't know how to measure that. How can we set a plane from which to measure banking. How can we set a plane from which to measure banking so that I have a concept of up? Well, again, let's go to giant picture. Oh, sorry, I gotta keep numbering things consistently. Let's go to giant picture and let's go to curve like this. And let's say I'm at this moment right here, where this is my unit tangent vector. And this is my unit normal vector. Now you're gonna get all upset. You say, no, no, Dave, you said those were perpendicular. Why did you draw it like that? But remember, I can draw in perspective. I'm allowed to do that. So as long as I draw a little right angle marker between these, right? Of course, there are right angles. I just showed you there are right angles. 
by drawing the right angle marker. So don't ever forget your right angle marker. But what does this create? These two vectors are perpendicular to each other, so long as I'm turning at all. Of course, if I'm not turning, there is no direction of turning, there is no n. So let's assume that I am turning, but these two vectors are not in the same line, so they do what? They create their own plane. And this plane is like the surface of the racetrack. The surface of the racetrack that allows me to derive or to state the concept of up. So let's define what direction is up. That's English words. Let's define it by creating a vector that's mutually perpendicular to T and N, that's perpendicular to this plane. And you know how we're going to do that. We're going to cross T and N. Because when I cross two vectors, I automatically create a third vector that is perpendicular to the first two. And in mathematics, this is called the unit binormal. The unit binormal. Let me unpack those words. Normal means it's normal to T and N. It's normal to two things at once. Or I could say it's also normal to T. So I have two vectors that are normal to T. You can think of the bi in either way. The B is normal to two vectors at once, or bi normal. Or you could say bi normal means it's normal to T and N. It's the second vector that's normal to T. Unit length. Well, this is cool. It's automatically one unit long. How do I know that? Because I know that the magnitude of any cross product, make sure I got my paper in order, thank you, is mag u, mag v, sine of the angle between u and v. The magnitude of a cross product is the area of the tile created by u and v. But T and N, let's use T and N instead of U and V. T and N are one unit long and 90 degrees from each other. So what's the area of this tile? The area of this tile is one square unit. So the length of this vector, one times one times the sine of 90 degrees is one unit long. Automatically, these are one unit long. Now let me put the direction of up here into this drawing which did get a little cluttered. I apologize for that. <coughs> Let me make the direction of up green. Let me try to make it look one unit long. And how am I going to make it look perpendicular? My little perpendicular symbols right here. Now I've created a great victory. T N and B are a frame of reference. Inherent, that means coming from, built into the path C. T, N, and B are automatically a frame of reference, a right-hand rule. It's hard for me to get my whole hand under the camera, so I apologize. But do you see the right-hand rule? T cross N is B. B is up. Now, be very careful. Up for the path may not be up for the pilot. 
And we'll talk about that later. You, you already feel that in a very casual way, right? As a pilot flies along some very twisting path, the pilot could be upside down with respect to the earth, but still feel pressed into his or her seat. So I'm talking about what direction is up with respect to the curve. We can think about the pilot in a second. But I now have my own independent frame of reference flying through space with me as I twist and turn throughout space. My hand is too big to fit into the camera, so I'm looking for another visual object. And unfortunately, I don't have my Rubik's Cube fixed right now, but I have my large Rubik's Cube picked, right? Think of the Rubik's Cube as a frame of reference. T, N, and B. And that frame of reference is flying along the path with me. I pull out my smaller Rubik's Cube. It's easier to manipulate. But the colors are all mixed up. I have fixed this one recently. This is quite an achievement. And in honor of the people that develop things, sometimes you name them after the people. So this is named after the French mathematician Frenet. This is called the Frenet frame. The Frenet frame. So it, it's about 50-50 when you read a book. Some people call this the T and B frame. Uh, that vector language gets annoying. Some people call it the Frenet frame. But I think in honor of the person, I'm going to stick with the Frenet frame. But if you read a book and it says a TNB frame, then you know what you're talking about, right? Okay, this is not all the Frenet frame does for me. The Frenet frame actually does more. But I need some practical ways to compute it. So let's emphasize what we've achieved so far. But the problem is we've been talking mostly in theory. That is, T is the direction I'm going. That is the rate of change of position with respect to distance. That's a beautiful theoretical picture. But if I ever have to calculate it, I'm going to do V over mag V. Remember, these two are related by ds dt. If you multiply this by ds dt, you get dr dt. If you multiply this by ds dt, you get ds dt is mag v, you get dr dt, which is v. So these are the same, but this is a word picture description, a vector picture description. This is a practical calculation. Then we defined n to be the rate of change of turning with respect to distance. Divided by the magnitude of this vector. So again, I could cut out the ds's and say dt dt over magnitude of dt dt. And I've got t right here. But this would be a horrid, horrid way to calculate this. Very, very messy. So I'm going to put that on hold for a second and rather focus on B. Now, B is kind of the rate of change of my rolling, right? My uprightness changes if I roll. So, in theory, I could think of it as the rolling I do or the direction of uprightness, the direction of up. And in theory, I define that to be T cross N. But I could do this in a much more practical way. 
Because remember, in this picture right here, this is a trouble. I'm going to clutter this picture too much. But let's take it over to the side and redraw it. Remember, T is based on V. T is V over mag V. And I will never change direction unless I'm experiencing acceleration. So the only reason I should ever turn left or right is if I'm being pulled in the left or right direction. That means V is changing. And what's the vector that describes V's change? The rate of change of V with respect to time is called acceleration. The rate of change of velocity with respect to time is acceleration. So velocity must live in this Tn plane. And we'll demonstrate that physically later. But if velocity lives in this Tn plane, then crossing V and A will be pointing in the same direction, direction as crossing T and N. So T and N, one unit long, that's beautiful. Let me move my paper up. But V cross A, those are things I have at hand as soon as someone gives me a curve. I can do one derivative to get V, two derivatives to get A, and V cross A is a simple calculation. I don't have to build T and N to find V. I could just do V cross A. How do I make V cross A one unit long? Divide by magnitude of V cross A. Now I have a unit vector that points in the direction of uprightness, that points out of the direction of turning. So this is how I calculate B in practice. And then let's go back to my picture. Let's do the right-hand rule. If I have T and B, how do I create N? Well, T cross B is going the opposite of N. How about B cross T? If I do B cross T, I'll be one unit long and pointing in the direction of N. So this is how you calculate N in a painless way. But I want to say some words as we're approaching the top of the hour now. What I'm presenting to you here is a little more detailed than it's presented in the book. Some books present more, some books present less. You need all the details right now. So I'm presenting basically, essentially, almost all the details. If someone asks you to calculate the T and B frame, this theory is beautiful, but it's not good for calculating. Not useful always for calculation. If someone wants you to calculate the T and B frame, this is how you calculate. And I say this to everybody, but everybody always, once in a while, a couple of people fall into this trap. They do T and then N and then B. And that's not the way you calculate. First, you calculate T, then you calculate B, and then third, you calculate B cross T to give you N. But in the book, they present it in a theoretical way and they do T and then N and then B. If you do that, you're doomed. You're pretty much doomed because this calculation right here could be massive. This is the practical way to calculate the TNB frame. Okay, so <coughs> we've gone pretty far here. What direction am I turning? What direction is up? How sharp is the curve? We've defined curvature. What remains? And I think I could bring it in. In the worst case, just introduce it. How do I measure rule? Excuse me. <coughs> Small cough. How do I measure rule? 
you're a suction pig. What does suction pig do? Suction pig holds up my phone. And let's say suction pig is pilot of the plane. Suction pig can drive on a straight line. Suction pig can bank. Suction pig can also roll as they travel through space. How do I measure roll? Okay, let's see what we can do here. And even if I only introduce this now, we'll finish it up later, but it is in my notes. So remember, dt ds dotted with t is naturally zero. So is db ds dotted with b. Let's think about that. I would just do it the same way, right? And I'm not gonna repeat that calculation right here. If b dot b is magnitude b and magnitude b is one, then I just differentiate both sides of this. With respect to t, with respect to s, whichever measuring stick I'm using. And I would learn that db ds is also perpendicular to b. I want to measure how B changes. Remember B is one unit long. So the only thing B can change is twisting. Let me get out my tiny vectors right here. I should have some other kind of tiny vectors. The direction I'm going, direction I'm turning blue, and now direction of uprightness, which is green. I don't have enough dexterity in my fingers to hold these nicely. But green, which is pointing up at the camera with you, that is measuring how does B change? B can only change in its direction. And what happens when B changes direction? I am rolling. I am rolling out of a curve or into a curve. So let's examine DBDS from another perspective. Since B is T cross N, in theory, in real life, B is T cross N, and the cross product obeys differentiation rules. So I get T D S cross N plus T cross DNDS. Now remember, I might have to move my paper up. Let me check. No, we're doing okay. Remember, DTDS divided by the magnitude of DTDS is N, and that magnitude is called kappa. So DTDS is already pointing in the direction of n. So if I keep going here, what's kappa n cross n? What is the area formed if you cross a vector with itself? Well, there's no parallelogram there, right? That's naturally zero. So all I have left right here is t cross dn ds. So dbds could also be characterized as, this is zero, t cross dnds. What does that tell you? dbds is perpendicular to t because it was formed by a cross product involving t. It's perpendicular to b. Right? 
because it was perpendicular to be up here. Well, what's, I'm running out of dimensions. If I'm perpendicular to T and I'm perpendicular to B, I'm gonna make sure I got my paper going on here. DB, DS, there's only one direction left. Perpendicular to T, perpendicular to B. DB, DS must be along N. In other words, this is a physical demonstration of what I just said. If I have vectors, I cannot, I gotta make myself some little toothpick model or something. If I have mutually perpendicular vectors, T and N and B up here in green, let me move that under the camera. It's a little bit distorted. How does B change? B changes either what? By turning towards N or turning away from N. And that's what I'm gonna call roll. So dBDS is a vector along N. And a vector, remember, has direction and magnitude. What's the magnitude of dBDS? Well, if B is changing quickly, you know, snap, snap, then I must be rolling very quickly. But if B is changing gradually, oh, slow roll, slow roll, then the rolling, the twisting must be small. So this quantity is called tau or torsion. It's a little bit like how we described kappa curvature. Now there's one problem. Kappa, can I find the paper? Kappa was defined to be this magnitude of the rate of change of T and that could only be greater than or equal to zero because if I turn in one direction, that's the direction T turns. But rolling, you can roll out of a curve or you can roll into a curve. This can be plus or minus. So I cannot say tor torsion is magnitude of dBDS. What I can say is I will say the magnitude of torsion is the magnitude of dBDS. The size of the torsion indicates the size of the roll. And now for purposes that are historical, this will be the last thing we say. When I'm looking in the driver's seat, so I'm looking at the back of the arrow T, so you put a little circle with a cross in it to mean the back of the arrow T. Here's B and N, right hand roll, and I'm facing the direction I'm mo moving. I'm in the driver's seat. We call clockwise rotation, clockwise twisting. We call that positive torsion. Tau is greater than zero. And counterclockwise twisting is a little bit too tight in my writing. I apologize. Counterclockwise twisting is called negative torsion. And that's when tau is negative. So now I've defined what it means to roll and how to measure roll. Now remember this again, it's a theoretical description. It's not a practical description. 
Next time I'll bring you the practical description. But now you have enough to do some damage on your homework. And we have other things we want to define, but this is great victory. A frame of reference, I can measure how tight I'm turning with it, and I can measure how much I'm rolling and which direction I'm rolling with it. Okay, thank you for being patient as I had this very different day. I think I did record everything fairly and we'll see how it goes, but I did the best I can. Look at that sheet. We will see you next time. And uh, if you have a question, you can hang around and ask a question. I think I can turn off the recording and then we'll get the recording posted. Okay, recording is...